Okay, well, um, a few minutes past here. I guess I'll probably go ahead and get started here. Um, yeah, so I guess actually this is going to be our last session here. So um, already to the end, in some ways, the semester, as usual, kind of seemed fast. But uh, actually, I'll, maybe I'll take that back. This is one semester where it definitely seemed a lot slower than uh, it seemed to take a lot longer than uh, than sometimes it seems like it flies by. But, uh, well, so I mean, as usual, um, I was just planning on going over. I'll, I'll start with the uh, kind of the little problem set that I posted last time. Uh, there is um, uh, this is from the previous chapter, uh, of course. So, uh, of course, there's a problem set that I posted this week as well. Um, I'll post example solution of that sometimes, sometime next week. Um, but yeah, I probably won't, you know, <laughs> I guess we won't have a session where I'll go over that. So, but um, of course, you're free if, if you have any question about this one or other ones, you know, you can always send me an email or let me know. Um, yeah, so for you guys that are here or anybody that's watching this later, uh, so, you know, you've, you've got basically this week's chapter 14, uh, which is kind of the last material that we're going to be covering. Um, I still did have a quiz this week over that, so make sure you finish that up. Um, I haven't posted the test yet. Like I said, I'm going to post that Friday, um, although I'm, I still, I'm still work, kind of working on it. Um, um, just saying that, uh, and I got um, kind of my days filled tomorrow, so I'm not certain if I have it completely ready by Friday morning. So uh, it'll be up sometime Friday, but I hope nobody was hoping to start on it, look at it like early in the morning. So I hope to get it posted by noon or so, at least by Friday. Um, uh, all right, well, um, the, the problem set over the uh, the chapter 13 in the edition of the textbook I'm looking at, the, the chapter that we looked at last week on the instruction set, dressing modes and formats. Um, I, I'm guessing this one probably didn't take as long as the previous one if, if for people that uh, worked on these um, by hand. Um, here. So, and, and actually the first two questions are somewhat similar. So both of them are just kind of testing that, you know, that, that you understand some of the basics of these addressing modes that we um, covered in, in the previous chapter. So the, the previous chapter, you know, if you remember, was kind of a lot of it was about this idea of the addressing modes, um, as well as the format of the, um, of the, uh, the, op, the, um, the the operation and opcode fields and things, but but especially the the addressing modes and decoding those and things about that like that. So, so, um, so yeah, I probably won't spend too long on this because um, I think we can kind of go through these relatively quickly. Um, um, I think this first one um, probably there shouldn't be too much question on the answers on these. I wouldn't think. Um, so anyway, so uh, the, the immediate mode of addressing is kind of the mode where you encode the value in the actual um, um, opcode fields. Um, so in one of your um, operand fields, right? So, so basically, if you've got 20 in the um, um, field, you know, so if you have like a load instruction and then you have a 20, uh, what that means is you're using like a value of 20 or a constant value of 20. So that is what would get loaded into the accumulator if you're using like a one address uh, machine here, right? And in, and in this case, the EA means the effective address. Um, um, there's not really, I mean, the effective address is really, uh, we don't know what it is, but whatever the current program, whatever the current instruction is that you're executing, the uh, value is encoded basically at that memory address or the next memory address. So that's really the effective address is, is the current program counter or the current program counter plus, plus well, the, the bits for the field for that operand that where we encoded the 20 here. So. Um, and then direct, whether it's um, 
memory direct or register direct. Uh, we didn't we didn't have register direct on this first one here, but um, this this implies we're doing like a memory direct. So that means that you basically have to look in memory and the value in memory. Um, so so th this refers to a memory address twenty. Um, and whatever value we find in memory at memory address 20 is what should be loaded into the accumulator. So, so you should end up with 40 in the accumulator here. And then indirect, um, like I discussed a little bit, I, I kind of think of this as sort of like pointers. If, if you've ever done some things using pointers in like C or other languages that have a, a basic pointer type. So really, um, this forces us to actually do two memory references. So um, 20 is going to be referencing some location in memory that we interpret itself as a memory address. So uh, in this case, memory 20 has a value of 40. So we interpret 40 as the actual memory address that holds the value that we want to load into the accumulator. And so since 40 has a value of 60, that should end up in the accumulator. So yeah, our effective address is 40 in that case, um, which is what the, the, the memory address 20 is referencing 40. Um, and then 40 holds the value 60, which gets loaded to the accumulator in your zone. Um, then the other three on this problem set were kind of repeats. So again, if we're doing immediate, um, you have an accumulator, should be loaded to 30. If you do it directly from 30, 30 has a value 50, so 50 should get into the accumulator. And if you do an indirect from 30, 30 is, has a memory address of 50 and 50 has a value of 70. So that would get loaded into our accumulator. And so really this is just showing, uh, well, three kinds of addressing modes that we talked about, immediate and memory direct and memory indirect here. So the second one, um, kind of more of the same, except for we also extend to a couple of others like register indirect um, um, and displacement and things. So um, imagine that you have a 16-bit processor. Um, so so we, and, and each one of these represents eight bits. So, so the, the two addresses from 200 to 201 are actually our operand and opcode fields here. Um, and then the, the second eight bits here have an operand, which we're going to, which we may interpret different ways depending on the mode bits here, whatever number of bits we use for the mode. So, so um, again, for immediate, I'll jump to that one. That, that's the easier one. So immediate, we're going to be using the bits in the operand field directly as like a constant value. So that's 500 in this case. So again, if we're doing like a load, um, we're just going to load 500 of the accumulator. So in that case, this is what I was talking about before. So the effective address is really the, the program counter or, or the, the appropriate field of bits uh, where our program counter currently is. So um, in our instruction fields here. Um, so for direct, we would... Um, interpret this as a memory location and whatever value is at memory address 500, we would load into the accumulator. Um, so we're given in the problem description that um, 399 cases contains, 99, location 400 contains, contains 1,000. So if you just keep doing that, so this was supposed to imply that, yeah, if you just keep by that pattern, 500 is, is, is 100 away from 400. So uh, address 500 should have had a, a value of 110 or 1100 in it. Um, so that would be what would get loaded into your accumulator for a direct memory addressing mode here. Um, and then a memory indirect, like we already talked about, but uh, if we interpret 500, we, we just said that um, it's pointing to 1100, but the value in 1100, again, you know, if you figure this out, you basically have to add 600 to every location to get what its value is. So, so the, the value at mem memory address 1100 should be a 1700. Um, so for the indirect, that would be what would get loaded into our accumulator here with an effective address of 1100. Um, all right, and then 
And then the others, though, are some things we haven't looked at yet. So PC relative would be some kind of addressing mode that's relative to the current program counter. So here there's a little bit where, you know, I, I could, um, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily count it wrong if I was grading these, you know, because you could have assumed that maybe the program counter is 202, for example, or maybe 201. 201 probably isn't really a correct, in this machine, in, in this one with a 16-bit kind of um, instructions, um, most likely the program counter should be um, incremented by two every time we uh, fetch an instruction, okay? So once we fetch this instruction, it takes two words to hold the full instruction. The program counter should be incremented to 202, right? So 201, um, um, uh, uh, and actually I'm contradicting myself. So, um, no, no, that, I'm sorry, that, that's what I had here. So, so, so 202 is probably the, the better, um, 200 is maybe a little bit more understandable. Um, so this depends on whether you interpret uh, that the, the relative uh, address calculation is gonna happen before the automatic increment to the next instruction occurs or after. Uh, but again, most likely, I mean, most likely all of the address decoding and all those other things um, that are part of the control unit that we talk about, those probably happen the, the at, right after the fetch, immediately the program counter is, is usually going to be incremented. And then the control unit starts doing all of the decoding for the, uh, the, the operands for like memory addressing things. So. So among possible alternatives for PC relative, probably the best one is to think that the program counter is 702. So that means um, um, you're supposed to be adding, thinking of the, um, the, the value in the operand as an offset from the current program counter location, which would be 202 at this point. So that would give you an effective address of 702, which would have a value of 1302, if you add 600 to that. So. So that would be our, our value that would get loaded to the accumulator here. Um, and then displacement addressing or um, some kinds of indexing addressing, very important kinds of address modes. So lots of, of stuff actually are done with um, more things like displacement or base offset sort of addressing mode. So. Um, here again, there could be some interpretation. So you might have used the register one, uh, but probably the most correct interpretation would be that you know since we say there's a a, a a register that contains a base address, displacement is kind of like a base address plus an offset. So most likely that base address is meant to imply that that is what is used for regular displacement kinds of addressing here. So um, we said somewhere here that the uh, register one is 400. Uh, the base register contains a value 100. Um, and so you have to consider that the base memory address. And then you have to consider the operand here as the offset. So you should add those together to get a, an effective address of 600, um, which would have a value of 1,200 that ends up getting loaded into the accumulator here. Um, And then, you know, register indirect. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I skipped. Uh, so the register and register indirect, um, we talked about are kind of analogous to the memory and the memory indirect. So, so for register, um, if our mode specifies a register, in that case, we're not really using the operand for this instruction, um, right? So, you know, um, but, but um, anyway, so if this mode indicates a register addressing mode, say it, it's, it's implying that we're supposed to be using register one, just whatever the value is in, is in register one would get loaded to the accumulator um, here. So, so we, we said that the register one has a value 400, so that would get loaded to the accumulator. Um, the register indirect, then we would interpret that value 400 as an actual memory address so then we'd have to go to memory location 400 um, 
and the, the value that we find there. Right. So in this case, register indirect is kind of like memory direct. Right. So so in this case, we have we have a uh, a memory address um, and then whatever the value is from that one single memory reference, um, we would load to the accumulator, which, which would be a thousand um, in this case. Um, And then auto indexing. Um, this one again, you could probably correctly interpret this in some slightly different ways. Maybe uh, this is the way that I interpret it. So since since we specified that we are doing pre increment, um, uh, most likely what that means is that we're using register one. We're going to increment that first before we then do our displacement addressing. So, so register one is kind of like uh, an offset that we're going to be adding to the operand um, value 500 here. And, and register one had the 400, but we're going to pre increment that. So that would become 401 that we would add to 500 to get the effective address. Uh, although, again, another thing here, you know, so we don't specify, uh, you know, last week we talked about this idea of. Um, of a scaling factor, which the x86 um, um, auto indexing kinds of things use like a scaling factor. So, so you don't have to pre-increment or post-increment by one, you could, you could increment by, by two or four. Um, so since we don't specify scaling factor, I mean, a, a natural scaling factor might be two in this case, um, since we're using a 16-bit architecture. So, um, so, so another valid answer might be 902, um, um, where, which would have a value of 1502 here. Um, yeah, so that was, that was kind of most of the review of kind of the most important addressing modes that we talked about. So the last one here um, is probably the most open to interpretation. Um, so we're using kind of this mnemonic of, of an addressing mode, you know. So so this is supposed to um, represent a um, um, a, a, a kind of um, um, indirect addressing. So whatever the value of the location is in memory, we're supposed to interpret that as a memory address. So then we have to follow that to the actual location. Right, so, so a, a memory indirect um, is, is what this is describing here, uh, and then we're describing some sort of a pre, a post increment or a pre increment, or likewise a, a, a pre decrement or a post decrement uh, here um, indexing that's occurring. Um, Although this isn't quite like the um, uh, auto indexing that we're talking about because we don't have two things we're adding together in this case. So, so we're just simply incrementing or decrementing um, the, um, the, the value in the register and then using that as an indirect um, memory reference here. So. But still, there's a lot of interpretation. So I gave my own um, for this answer. So, so if you had different assumptions, you could get some valid sort of different ways of thinking that the results could occur here. But, but these were my kind of assumptions for this problem that I gave you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that, that this meant like an indirect referencing from the description here. Um, and um, so these opcodes, we're assuming that we're using like a, a, um, a two address format. And the first one is, is going to be used as the first operand, but also as the implied, or the way I'm doing it, I'm using it as the first operand, but also as the implied destination of the operation, okay? Uh, but also another thing that's a bit tricky here is that um, um, there's some ambiguity of where that destination should be, right? So the way I interpreted that is 
whatever the final value is in X after we do any increments or decrements um, would be the final destination. And so that can end up being different from the initial where we pull the, the first operand here um, after, you know, wh whatever the value of, of X is when we're ready to do the, the store of the result um, is, is where we would store that, okay? So again, that may or may not be the way that you thought of this. Um, that may or may not be a very good uh, example of how typical to address um, operands might work here, but, but that's kind of how I'm doing things on this example here. Um, so, and I gave a uh, kind of an example of memory here where X holds a thousand. So since we're doing, since I'm assuming this means indirect addressing. So whenever we, we do this with the um, parentheses around it, that we're going to follow that 1000 or whatever the current value is in X to the at, to that memory address to get the actual value that we um, use for the operand, all right? Um, so, and yeah, I'm just making this like an add, opera, uh, an add um, operation here for our opcode. I mean, it could be anything, but um, so the, the question was, um, uh, which of these ends up being like a stack? Um, operation if you perform it, right? So again, you, you might have different answers if, if you had some different assumptions, but but for it to be a stack, if you had an, an, this example, um, so if I'm assuming the thousand is the top of the stack, if the stack is growing towards zero, right? So if the next item, if I pushed it on, would end up at memory address 999, and then the next one we push on would be 998. That means the, the stack is growing towards zero, okay? Um, and for this, this operation to be a plus where the top of the stack is A, that means the second item on the stack is B. So that we, for this to be like a stack operation, we'd have to pop off A and B, add them together, and then the result A plus B would end up being pushed back on to the stack and the top of the stack would be 1001 at that case, right? So if any of these end up with uh, 1001 as the top of our stack and X here, um, and A plus B in 1001, that would be as if we were treating the stack as growing towards zero, going in this direction, right? Um, but there's another possibility. I mean, you could also, I mean, you, and, and uh, stacks work both ways in some machine architectures, even in the same architecture, they can sometimes grow either towards the end of memory or towards the beginning of memory. Um, but again, if, if we interpret 1,000 at the top of the stack, it could be that 999 and 998, so A is at the top, and then E is, is the next item below A on the stack, and D is below that one, right? And, and we're growing towards bigger addresses. So in that case, if we popped off the top two values, we would pop off A and E, and they would get added together, and they would, they would get pushed back onto the stack at location 999. Right, so 999, if, so if you end up with 999 in X and A plus E at memory location 999, that would be as if you were doing a stack operation where the stack is growing in, in that direction, all right? So anyway, that, that's, that's how you, we can tell whether, whether these end up being a stack operation or not with my example contents of memory here. So I'd finish these off. So, so for this one, um, my interpretation would be again: you would the the, um, the processor would first um, decode this first operand. So without the parentheses, I, I interpret that as a direct uh, instead of an indirect memory reference. Um, so we would just load the value in X, um, whatever whatever um, X is here. So I didn't specify that, but but X has a value of 1,000, so that would get loaded as the first operand. We're going to perform my plus operation where the operation is on. And then we would do an indirect reference. So, uh, you know, we would first go to, a, to memory location X, which has a 1,000. Then we would find, follow a 1,000, and it has a value of A. So the result would be that that, that would get decoded to having A. Um, we would add those together. That result then, um, like I was saying, um, would 
uh, the, the, this first operand is, in one of my assumptions also acts as the implied destination for this to address uh, format machine here. Um, so here, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that if there's no indirect ref referencing, then we would just uh, save that result back to a thousand, right? So, so in this case, the, the, uh, the, the reference wouldn't change, right? Th those bits specifying a thousand would still be a thousand in this case. So the result, uh, 1000 plus A would actually end up back in memory here at memory address X in that case. So that's definitely, definitely not an example of a stack operation. Um, we didn't do anything with any of these values here, so, or even here, so. Um, so here for this one, um, we're using indirect referencing for both of these. So we would first end up pulling A out for this indirect reference. And then since we don't do any pre or post uh, increment of that value, um, uh, X is still a thousand. So we would pull off A again. And we would just add those together, though after we pull off the second A decoding the indirect reference, uh, we would increment X to 1001. So um, um, the result would just be A plus A, and we would end up, uh, to, again, this, this you know depends on your assumption. So I'm assuming that we would decode that then as, um, 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 since memory address 1000 holds, um, or memory address X holds 1001 now, the result would get stored back in 1001. So we would end up with um, A plus A here at 1001, right? So that's almost like uh, my stack growing towards zero, except we didn't end up with the right result. We ended up with A plus uh, A because we got 1001. So it's like our stack pointer. Um, um, got reduced, uh, stack top got reduced down to 1001, like we popped the two values off, but we didn't, we didn't add A plus B, we just added A plus A. So we didn't get quite the, the correct result at the top of the stack there. Close, but not quite right. Um, so not an example. Um, so this one, would be a possible example, um, the way that I interpreted it and my assumptions. So, so um, pretty similar, but um, so we've, we first end up fetching A from our indirect reference and then we increment um, um, X. So X becomes 1001 um, in this case, right? So, the, and then at that point, um, um, we're gonna end up fetching from memory address 1001, which has B, um, right? So that's why we end up adding A plus B in this case. And now since um, um, X got incremented to the value of 1001, the result will go st we be stored back into 1001 again, right? Um, so again, another, another assumption here, I, I forgot to mention here, but I assume that even though this is a post increment operation, um, we don't, do the uh, decode for the store until after any pre or post increment occurs from the decoding of both of the operands here. So, so that's why this one ended up in 1001. And again, this ends up in a, a thousand one, although this is, this is, this should be pretty um, uncontroversial because even though we do the post increment here, um, uh, we still have another operand to decode. So, so, so the, the operand, the, the X has a value of 1001 when we're decoding this indirect reference here. So, so yeah, the, the result, if you followed that um, is, is, yeah, we end up with A plus B in 1001 now and 1001 in memory address X. So that looks like, we popped A, popped to B, add them together and push them back on. So now we got A plus B at 1001 and we got our stack top pointer pointing to memory address 1001, right? So that looks like a stack growing towards zero that we just did a um, add operation on the top two items of the stack here. So yeah, that's kind of an example of a, of a stack operation. Um, Okay, 
So then for D, um, um, this is like a pre-decrement. So, so, so X would end up with a value of 999 before we do the indirect reference. Um, so that means that we're gonna use uh, E for our first operand because memory address 999 has a value of E in, in my example. Um, but then, yeah, we don't decrement or increment it again. So um, we're just gonna fetch E again, add the result. Uh, and then that result will get stored back into memory address 999, okay? So again, um, this might look like a stat going in the other direction, except we don't end up with A plus E in 999 here. So it's not quite right. Um, here we do a pre-decrement and a, a post-increment. So we pre-decrement, uh, which means we end up fetching the E from 999. Um, and then, I mean, nine, then X is still gonna be 999 when we start decoding the second operand. Um, so we're gonna fetch E again, but then we'll, we will um, increment um, X back up to a thousand. So the result would be we would store um, E plus E uh, back over to here. So kind of clobber our stack pointer or our stack top with the result of, of E added to itself. So. Um, and then for F here, we're, um, we're doing two post uh, increments. So we first end up fetching the value from uh, memory address 1000, that's the A, and we would do an increment. And then we would fetch the value from memory address 1001, which would give us the B um, here. And we, we would increment again. Um, so. Um, X ends up being 1,002 from these, and the results would, would be stored um, here in, in memory address 1,002. So, uh, so 1,002 will get A plus B here. So um, this is kind of almost like a stack if we could somehow get the two top items uh, but push them back on and then push the result. But that, so that's not how you normally do stack, um, do, do a stack machine or stack computation. So, so you don't keep the operands on after you consume them. Um, um, and then finally, the final one um, is another example of a possible stack operation with the stack going in the other way. So here we do a, a post decrement. So, so that would cause us to fetch A from 1,000 and then we do a, a decrement. So now X would be 999 for the second indirect um, memory um, uh, reference here. Uh, so that would cause us to fetch E. Um, we would add A plus E, that would be our result. And then we would end up, you know, so, so X would still have 999. So we'd end up putting A plus E into, um, memory 999. So that would have the result like, like, it, like I talked about. So that would end up having A plus E here at 999 and X pointing to 999, which looks like we popped off the, the top two items, add them together, and then push them back um, onto the new top of our stack at 999 when our stack is growing down towards uh, the, is it growing towards the, the, the bigger addresses or the end of memory here instead of the beginning of memory. All right. Um, so yeah, all those questions I just realized were kind of about memory address or mostly about memory address. I didn't have any about um, um, like uh, formats or fields or anything, but um, yeah. So any, any kind of questions on those or comments on them? Again, um, as a, as a hint, I mean, you know, I'm probably going to be using similar problems like these um, on the test here. Um, I mean, that's kind of my plan. So, so yeah, I mean, you very well could see um, a question, you know, where I ask you to do some things where you have something that represents um, instructions um, with different addressing modes and, you know, give me the contents of memory or, or something. So. So those would be good things. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, even if you're not doing these problems, um, be good to maybe re review these if you're 
as you're thinking about our second test here. Um, Um, all right, so if no questions, um, I guess I'll kind of move on here. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, we're currently working on our um, chapter on um, processor structure and function here. Um, yeah, that's chapter 14 in the 10th edition. Actually, we're, um, uh, again, I don't think anybody is using the 11th edition, or at least nobody's been commenting to me about that, but um, it's actually like chapter 16 in the 11th edition. There's, they added like two chapters in between the 10th and the 11th edition. Actually, they split two chapters, I found out. So um, that used to be a single chapter here in the 10th edition. So. Um, oh, another note when I think about this, um, so I know this is kind of the end of the class here, and I'm not going to really cover chapter 15 or 16 um, on the test. But I mean, since you are taking this class, um, you know, if you have a little bit of time before, you know, after after things are done here, I mean, I would recommend still maybe going through and, and at least looking over chapter 15 and 16. Um, especially 16. So there's some good stuff in there about um, uh, superscalar, um, this idea of superscalar processing. It's, it's really, it's really even more details about pipelining. Uh, you know, so modern processors do a lot of stuff that, that we, we kind of introduced in this chapter today here that we're going to be talking about, uh, but even more complex. So, so out of order execution and um, predictive branching and, and things like that are, are talked about even in more detail here down in the superscalar stuff. So, um, so I think I mentioned before, you know, like, like for example, um, uh, this stuff, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I've, it's, 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 it's it, from, from my feeling about where processor design is, um, I mean, things have gotten so complex that that it's it's tough to imagine that that they can continue pushing performance from adding more, you know, things like like doing the super scaling processing and, and pushing the pipelines and stuff like that, right? Not to mention, you know, those things are causing bugs like the the Spectre bug. We, I mentioned that before, you know. So so Spectre um, um, was all about. Um, this kinds of doing branch predictions um, and people exploited a way of, of being able to um, um, see the results of some of those branch predictions and, and to use that to be able to determine things in memory that they're not supposed to be able to see. So, you know, which, which is still kind of a, an unresolved issue that um, they're trying to figure out how to completely fix kind of the vulnerabilities that that introduced and that, that, that's all kind of a direct result of these sorts of complex pipelining that modern especially x86 modern processors um, engage in in order to increase performance um, um, all right So let's let's look at it. so yeah this I mean today might be relatively quick then um, after this um, um, because uh, I mean you know uh, I had a few things to say especially kind of about the um, um, uh, some of the the calculations on the instruction pipeline here but um, so. So we're looking at kind of the details again, uh, or in more detail at, at some of the, the organization of the processor, you know, the, the control units and the registers um, and, and, you know, the decisions made internally, design decisions and things like that. So, so we, we already know, you know, from previous chapters that, um, you know, the, the, the functional requirements of the processor 
you know, it has to support um, a set of operations um, and the general instruction cycle, like we've talked about is, you know, we, we have to uh, support fetching an instruction from primary memory, interpreting that instruction, um, fetching the data implied by the um, um, instruction fields using different addressing modes, um, and then processing the, the operation. So processing the data according to the, the, the instruction that we just fetched, okay? So that's mostly the, the realm of the ALU for, for most um, data processing um, instructions. Um, and then the control unit is usually the one that's taking care of, of, of controlling all the stuff like the, the fetching and the interpreting um, and the decoding the operands. Um, the, the memory addressing operands. So, so most of that stuff, again, is kind of down in um, this box that, that we generally think of as the control unit. So as you can imagine, you know, if, if you ask the actual designer of a CPU, you know, probably they break this down as, into lots of sub sub units. Um, you know, like operand decoding and, and, uh, out and, and, and instruction fetch and, you know, other stuff like that. So, um, so to support all that, I mean, the, it's 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 absolutely necessary that the processor have um, a, a memory, um, a small internal memory, because it's just not fast enough to be doing all this stuff back and forth to main memory because of memory bottleneck and other issues that we've talked about previously in this class. Um, So, you know, um, so we need to store the data temporarily while we're processing it. Um, um, you know, as, as a simple example, we need to remember where the next instruction is. So we normally um, are, are processing uh, instructions sequentially. So we have to remember the instruction that we just processed so that we know what the next instruction is in memory that needs to be fetched and executed. Um, So, it, it, you know, and, and we've talked, you know, we had a whole chapter on kind of the ALU operations and, and, and things like that it supports, you know, the arithmetic operations and logical operations and things. Um, so this is a more detailed view. So one, one thing, um, th this is only the internal structure of the CPU. So only, so only this, uh, where we don't see the bus and, and like the other components like memory and IO devices, right? Um, kind of one point about this is that uh, you know it's kind of fractal, right? Or it, 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 it things it, it's it's another thing you know, that I like to point out, emphasize. It, it's an example of of how we hierarchically compose decompose complex systems like this. So this this internally on the CPU kind of looks like a microcosm of the whole computing system, right? Because we've got like a, a an internal bus upon which data flows. We got different units that are uh, things are flowing from, including one unit is kind of like the memory. So for our computing system as a whole, main memory acts as the, the memory. Uh, but if you're just drilling down to the processor, um, registers are the things that are holding the data that, that's being shuffled around um, between ALUs uh, and, and maybe other subcomponents here. Um, by the control unit mostly, right? So, um, so yeah. In, anyway, I mean, you know, it's kind of kind of a good example of what we mean by that, by by that idea of, of hierarchically decomposing things down into smaller stuff. And, and again, if you drill down into the control unit, you know, you'd probably see a similar kind of thing. So there'd be subunits down here on the control unit and, and some way of communicating between those subunits and, and so on. So, um, all right, so a little bit more about the registers. Um, I mean, a lot of this, uh, you know, the reason why I can go through relatively quickly today, I think, is a lot of this we have kind of come across already in this class or, or discussed 
um, 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 a lot of these concepts, right? So, um, so anyway, you know, a review, um, recall the memory hierarchy, you know, at, at higher levels external to the CPU, we've got a hierarchy of, 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 of levels of memory. So, you know, we've got different levels of cache out to the main memory. Um, and then you can even extend that to, you know, you can think of IO devices as a type of external memory that, 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 that is a kind of extension to primary memory and so on, right? Um, and we've got these properties that um, um, the, the, the lower levels, and by that we mean the levels closer to the processor tend to be, um, I'm sorry, that, that are further away from the processor uh, tend to be um, slower, but, but have larger capacities, right? And those are the cheaper ones. And the higher levels of memory up to, you know, you can think of registers as the highest level of memory um, for the most part. Um, but yeah, higher levels are going to be faster, um, but they're more expensive. Um, so, so they have to be smaller. Um, so registers absolutely function as a level of memory uh, above main memory and above caches, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you can kind of think of there's two categories or two roles of registers, user visible and control and status registers. Um, so yeah, I mean, some of these, um, especially the control registers, the programmers may or may not be aware of. And by programmers, I usually mean, you know, like assembly language, you know, people all the way down to the level of writing, low level device drivers and, and, and low level operating system basic um, code and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, usually user visible registers are the things that, that have opcode that you can directly get data into and out of them. Whereas control and status registers, um, I mean, status registers usually are not writable. They, they, they hold the results. Um, from operations, uh, but 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 there often are some bits that are changeable, although they're usually changeable by by you know special um, instructions rather than trying to load like um, load a value into the control register. So, so usually to change um, a control bit in a control register, you call an instruction, you know, to enable interrupts or disable interrupts, just to name one of these kind of more um, common control registers. So, um, so when you talk about user visible registers, uh, again, you can break these up into, um, in my mind, you can break them up into kind of two general classes, either, the, either they're gonna be general purpose or they're going to be non-general purpose. They, they, they might be more specialized. Okay, so and as we'll see, I mean, even um, and 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 there's not there tends to be if, if you look at actual x86 and ARM, which which we'll look at um, at the end of the class today here, um, the boundary isn't um, uh, the boundary is a bit fuzzy, right? So the, the, there's often a set of registers, but in some contexts. You can think of them as pretty general purpose. By general purpose, we mean uh, that, they're, that they can be written to uh, with with any kinds of data, and the data could be like data that represents an address, or uh, data that represents an integer or a float or something else, something like that, right? So by orthogonal, we, we talked about this previously. Um, we mean that. Uh, um, uh, it doesn't matter what the operation is. Um, um, the, the you know the, the data could be you know data or address data or something else um, in the the and it could be in the register if it's a general purpose register. Um, um, but then, kind of on the other end of of the sort of I think of it more as a spectrum. Um, sometimes the opcodes and, and even in the same machine architecture, sometimes the, the register can be interpreted more as general purpose. So, so it might be holding anything, but other times you have to interpret it 
where uh, whatever is the data in the register, it, it's going to be restricted to being interpreted as something more specific, like a floating point piece of data or, or, or like an address that's being manipulated or something like that. Um, but yeah, sometimes these have clearer separations. As, again, if you've read the um, the examples later on in this chapter, you'll see. So, so sometimes, you know, registers absolutely can't be used sort of in a general purpose way. They're always going to have some special purpose. I guess that's a good name for the other end of the spectrum, you know, so some special purpose value, like the program counter. So you normally can't just directly load in a value into the, the program counter, the instruction register. And you can only do that indirectly by executing a jump instruction, you know, of some kind. Or, so. Um, so another example, so you can think of condition code um, or status registers. Um, so control and status registers. As, as another kind of special purpose register. Again, usually not directly writable, although for control bits um, in control registers, um, you can often set those with, with special particular instructions. Um, but yeah, the, the, the most common way of thinking of condition codes are bits that are set by ALU operations or um, um, Possibly, like if you have a floating point unit or other kinds of unit, any any unit that performs like some sort of data processing unit might be setting your condition code bits. So. Um, our text mentions kind of in passing the study, kind of old study, the seventies here. Um, or, or um, 70s through the 90s, um, that, um, I mean, some people apparently have, have done some studies on these and, and it appears that, you know, if you have less than eight registers, um, it tends to start increasing the need for the amount of, of memory references that you, that, that your assembly language is going to have to um, do, um, uh, you know, if you have too few registers, basically, right, which is bad, you know, you want to reduce memory references, because every memory reference, you have to go out to main memory or to cache, um, and because of memory bottlenecks, that's going to slow you down. But, um, at least according to these studies, uh, the, there's an upper end, um, so above 32 or so, um, you don't seem to be able to de decrease the number of memory references that you end up needing, right? So I never looked at the, the details of those studies, but, but you know, I mean, certainly that intuitively seems about right, and not the numbers, but, but there's probably some range, you know, right? If you have too few, you're gonna be forced to, um, um, you don't have enough temporary space for calculations. So, so in order to uh, do some calculations, you have to save some things back out to main memory temporarily and bring some other things in. So you're basically doing some sort of low level memory management, shuffling things back and forth if, if you're doing some bigger calculations. But once you have enough, some minimal set of registers, um, having more than that, um, it becomes too complex to be able to do many kinds of calculations where you need more than that, right? So they just go to waste if you have more than those and you don't end up being able to reduce um, your need for memory references appreciably in that case. Um, although apparently, um, and, and you might not get the sense from, of this from our ARM example, but um, it's usually kind of standard knowledge that a risk approach uh, will tend to have quite a few more, okay, will have more um, um, registers than, than a CISC machine, okay? And that might seem a little bit opposite of what you think, since risk is supposed to be reduced um, complexity, right? But in order to get the performance you need from a risk machine, it, it makes sense because um, um, the, the, when, you're, when your basic operations are lower level, um, 
it forces you to need more temporary locations or else the, the number of memory references that you're going to need is going to increase much more rapidly, right? So, so yeah, if, if you have simpler instructions, um, um, that, that probably pushes up the, the, the minimum number of registers that you need in order to keep um, um, your amount of memory references below some sort of threshold here. Um, um, All right, so that was most of the things here, um, kind of some random things here. So, um, you know, so another thing that, that I hope everybody kind of learned from this course or remembers that, um, so, you know, all general purpose processors support um, some sorts of function call and return mechanisms. Um, and they also support um, interrupt uh, handlers and, and return from interrupts. And those are similar but separate kinds of mechanisms. Um, but yeah, in both cases, typically um, the uh, a lot of times that the the, um, the machine instruction to do a procedure call will automatically save some of the user visible registers onto um, a defined procedure call stack. Right. So at a minimum, usually, if nothing else, um, the program counter will get pushed onto the procedure call stack. Um, and then maybe that is the thing that gets automatically um, um, popped back off and restored to the program counter when the return instruction is, is um, executed to return from the procedure. Right. Um, you know, and, and likewise for interrupt handlers, there's often a special instruction for interrupt return that will do a similar thing for the uh, for a separate stack that handles the you know pushing the the values of registers onto the interrupt stack um, and then restoring those, including restoring the program counter on the interrupt return. So. Um, and, and maybe one more thing while I'm thinking about this, we, we talk, we talk a little bit more about interrupts again later on in this chapter. Uh, but, um, um, so there's often multiple call stacks. So often there's at least a call stack associated with each running process. So the current running process will have its procedure call stack, uh, and that will be separate from the, 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 the call stack for the operating system. So that's often called the system call stack. Right, um, so that's in order to make it easier to switch back and the, switch context back and forth between the operating system context and the um, the a process running as a user mode process. So, um, All right. So anyway, that that was that was user visible registers, um, control status registers. A few things about those. Um, um, so I don't know about most. I mean, yeah, I mean, there are actually lots of control registers that are used. Um, that are really internal to you know um, that that really you don't see at all. You know, from like the the assembly language programmer wouldn't see them at all, but 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 they're being used, so they're they're not part of these. But but you'll have, you know, um, um, registers um, um, holding stuff for like your multiply uh, accumulators and things like that, which are technically kinds of registers and things. Um, so some might only be visible in certain. Um, in certain operating modes. Um, so we've talked a little bit about those before. We'll talk about those again some more here um, in this chapter as well. Um, so, um,
So uh, anyway, sorry, I, I, I was trying to think about why. Um, so, so you can kind of think of these, uh, well, uh, so, so, so our, our book talks about kind of some um, registers um, that are essential in the context of executing instructions, right? So, so certainly the, the program counter and the instruction register makes sense. Um, and often the program counter, I mean, you know, it's visible, um, although it, it's not directly, it's not a general purpose register that you can just write to. Um, but you can often see what the current program counter is because that contains the address of the next instruction be fetched. Although like an x86, that's just called the instruction um, counter, I believe. Um, instruction register, um, so, so often then, you know, this one might not be visible, but, but often when you fetch the instruction, that's gonna be held somewhere um, in the processor for the decoding, for the control unit to decode all the fields of the instruction and, and do all the, the memory um, um, decoding and dereferencing and things. So. Um, and then the, the, you know, this, the, again, this goes all the way back to like the first few chapters of, of our textbook here. So um, you can think about like the MAR and MBRs that, that they talk about here. I mean, these are really just examples of more general purpose registers, right? So, so so what we call general purpose registers, any register that, that might be used to hold like an address or um, hold um, um, a, 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 a memory, you know, basically to hold data that comes to or from memory. Um, so again, I mean, a general purpose register could, uh, might be just um, be able to hold both either an address um, or uh, a piece of data, or sometimes you do get a split, you know, so some registers are meant to hold addresses, you know, like, like for indirect addressing or, or will be interpreted um, implicitly by some opcodes as holding address, whatever values in there. And some registers uh, might be uh, interpreted implicitly um, as a data value of some kind for certain operations, you know, like floating point operations or um, um, integer operations or things. So, um, so yeah, I mean, typically, you know, you don't have, you, you might have something called a PC in like a, you know, like again, in x86 is called something slightly different. In ARM, I believe it is called something like the program counter. Um, you won't have things called like these, but, but those are really like the general purpose registers. Uh, like the ABCD register register on x86 or the register zero, register one, register two on the um, ARM architecture. Um, so yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I mean, you can think of the program counter as, as a control register, right? So, so it, it's one of the more important one besides the, the, the like the status registers. Um, so, you know, typically um, the program counter uh, updates that uh, usually right after each fetch happens um, is when it gets incremented. Um, and as I keep kind of pointing out, you know, though um, um, it, it's normally incremented, it's, it's going to depend on the instruction length. So, so the size of the um, opcode instruction fields, right? So, so if instructions take two bytes, it'll get incremented by two. Um, and, and I assume, you know, I'm, I'm pretty certain that this is correct, that, that for like, a, like the x86 architecture that has variable length, uh, instruction formats, it will increment it, you know, depending on the instruction it just fetched, um, um, it will know what the length of that instruction was and it will increment the program counter appropriately to go over that, that to the next instruction, whatever the variable length was of the instruction that it just fetched. So, um, So I already mentioned, you know, the, the fetch instruction will often be in a um, instruction register for the, the control unit to do its decoding of all the fields um, and, and get the operands then. Um, uh, 
So yeah, and we kind of already mentioned this. So within the processor, the ALU may have direct access to all these that we've talked about. Um, and also typically, um, it'll probably have a lot of registers that you know nothing about um, or that are not exposed at all to the uh, instruction set um, that um, are used internally for buffering during, you know, multiply and divide instructions and shifts and things. So. Um, so anyway, besides that, um, um, you know, we have other kinds of status. Um, so, so, so usually there's one register that you can think of as a status. Actually, again, both in the X86 and R, we'll see that there's kind of one register um, that that's the, the the size of the um, of the architecture. You know, like 32 bits for a 32 bit architecture that contains bits that that, that are status bits. Um, also, that are intermixed with some bits that are control bits. And we've already run across the, the most important of these, you know, things like assign bit, zero bit, carry bit, overflow bit. Um, these all, these bits will all be set based on the last operation that's performed um, by the um, ALU unit. Um, so, you know, if the last result was a zero, then the zero bit would be set and so on. Um, so actually this one, um, you know, the interrupt enable disable, that, that's the example of a control bit. Um, so, uh, um, well, yeah, it showed those in there, but yeah, I probably would have put that over uh, when we talk about control registers. Uh, likewise, with like a supervisor, um, um, I mean, you can think of these as, as, as status as well. So, so, I mean, you know, you can you can read these to see whether interrupts are currently enabled or not. Um, but often, then you can you can um, usually um, um, execute a particular operation to enable or disable those. Uh, typically, you have to be in in um, system mode or the privilege mode, supervisor mode to run the instruction that would allow you to disable interrupts, for example. Um, likewise, there'll be a bit which tells you which mode you're in, whether you're in the, the, the supervisor mode or regular user mode, right? Um, and again, there'll be an instruction that you can do to set, you know, to, to change into supervisor mode. But again, you usually can't chain, if, if a user could just, if you're in user mode, which is the non-privileged mode, and if you could just run that instruction that would set yourself to supervisor mode, then there would be no, you know, there, there would be no um, super, there would be no privileged mode in the process. So, so normally you have to already be in supervisor mode uh, before you can change back into user mode, for example, right? Um, that's a little bit paradoxical. So, I mean, how do you get into supervisor mode from user mode in that case, right? So again, I think I'm, I'm, I'm skipping here, here, ahead here a bit, but the way that happens is through um, um, a software-based interrupt. So, so what's called um, an exception, right? So if you're in user mode, you can't directly set yourself into supervisor mode, but you can cause a software interrupt to occur, which would allow you to jump to an interrupt handler. Now the interrupt handler will be um, in the privileged um, portion of memory. And so it would be in supervisor mode. So it's safe to jump um, and change into supervisor mode if you're in the privileged memory, because the, even though the user can ask to switch back to supervisor mode, by, by causing um, a software interrupt to occur, they can't do anything to like change uh, the, the privileged interrupt handler, you know, in, in order to, you know, gain supervisor privileges or, or uh, root privileges. So um, anyway, that, that kind of stuff, I mean, you know, it's if, if you ever get a chance to take a course in security, those are some of the basic things you know that you have to start with when you when you think about computer security or building security into like an operating system, right? So that's that's what all these mechanisms are 
put in there for um, in the processor to, to allow operating systems to be built um, that have some sort of a privilege mode. So. Um, so, and there'll be a, a number of other control registers will be found. So, so often these are things like, like registers that hold like, for example, the, the pointers that I already talked about. So, so you'll have like, like a, a pointers to the, the current uh, function call stack for, for the user procedure call stack. Um, you might have a separate pointer, like I already mentioned for the system call stack. You'll have a, a, a separate pointer to the, uh, the page table for virtual memory address tra translation. Um, um, you'll have a, a, a pointer. You'll have a register that holds the, um, the beginning of the um, vector interrupt um, table um, for doing interrupt processing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that um, after we come back from break here. So. Um, so, yeah, and uh, kind of one final thing, this is just a little bit of a random aside here, but um, something I um, hadn't really known. I guess I guess it discussed it here. Um, I mean, the, the x86 architecture has general purpose registers A, B, C, and D. Um, I always thought that those were just kind of generic names, but but uh, I guess apparently, I thought it discussed it here. Uh, yeah, apparently those kind of uh, originally stood. So, so you can kind of use A, B, C, and D as general purpose registers, but in other contexts for other um, instructions. Um, they are used um, um, as, you know, as, as an accumulator for the A register, a base. So the base register for um, 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 the, uh, the, you know, doing the, the kinds of memory addressing where you take a base um, and add it to an offset, kinds of memory addressing, um, account register for, for some kind of incrementing, um, indexing, addressing. Um, and then a more general purpose data per data register, right? So anyway, I, I guess that, the, and, and for certain instructions, they, they still kind of uh, imply that that the special purpose thing. So if, if you do an instructions that like, that are kind of one address operand instructions that they use A as an accumulator as, as the, the result um, from um, doing an operation, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, we'll talk more about those when we get to the uh, x86 instruction uh, um, 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 uh, section here. So uh, yeah, let's it's 8:35. Why don't we take a quick uh, five-minute break here till about 8:40, so I can so everybody can take a, a, a bathroom break or whatever. So um, all right, so I'll see you in five. And there we go. Okay, we're back here. Um, so let's continue on. Um, so uh, next, next, we want to talk a little bit about the uh, instruction cycle again. Um, so, so you know, we um, back at the beginning of this course, we we did talk about the basics of how. The processor works, and we introduce this idea of, of the basic fetch and execute uh, cycle. Um, and we added in, you know, that that uh, is slightly more complex than that. Um, oh, we don't have that basic diagram, but but um, um, so if you want to support interrupts, basically you need to do a check after every execution of of your instruction, whether an interrupt has occurred or not. Um, and if you have an interrupt to do something to process the interrupt. Uh, but here uh, we wanna think uh, a little bit even in more detail about what happens um, typically for the, for the fetch execute mostly for, for, the, for the 
uh, inside the CPU, in, inside the control unit when, when we're doing the fetch and the execute. Um, so I'll you know draw your attention to this uh, figure 14.5, uh, which fleshes out in more detail um, an example of what might be happening um, kind of in the processor and in the control unit. Um, especially during the, the, the execute part of the stage, right? So, so, you know, actually the execution stage, you know, uh, that's where you have to, um, so after you fetch the instruction, which is relatively straightforward, I mean, you have, you have to actually decode the instruction. After you decode the instruction, you know, you're going to have the, the fields for the one or maybe two operands, for some instructions. Um, and, you know, those operands can be uh, pretty um, complex because they can involve um, some sort of uh, memory addressing, right? Um, you know, so in order to fetch the operand, <clears throat> I lose my voice a little bit. But yeah, for some of these, these um, addressing modes that we talked about, to fetch the operand, it might take, you know, one memory reference, two memory references, um, <clears throat> not to mention other things, you know, so we might have to add two things together, a base and an offset to get our um, indirect reference, which we then have to um, do a memory reference for um, to fetch, right? You know, so, so, this, this, um, so this is supposed to be a state transition diagram. Um, but this indirection is is um, kind of indicating that to do the fetch, if we're doing, for example, like a memory indirect, we have to do one fetch to go out to, to some location in memory to get an address. And then we have to do another fetch again to go to get to that address to get the actual value before we get to our operand. Um, and, and, and yeah, if, if you have two operands, you, have, you might have to do that for both of the operands, right? Typically, there's just one or two operands, um, although there could be more in some instruction sets. Uh, and then, I mean, you're not even done at that point. So, so you know, this data operation holds the, 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 the complex stuff that the ALU has to do to actually perform the operation for, for some types of instructions. But after that's done, you still have to store the result, which again also might be stored back into main memory. So, um, so, so you might have to interpret that operand and 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 uh, figure out how to store that value then um, in in memory. So, so anyway, um, the the whole point of this is that. Um, if, if you have a handle on, on the basic idea of this fetch execute or fetch execute interrupt cycle, uh, once you start drilling down, you can see that, that, that there's, there's many potential steps that need to be performed in order to actually execute the instruction, right? Um, and keep that in mind because, I mean, that directly leads to the idea of pipelining. So since there's so many steps here that need to be performed, um, that allows us to lead into this natural idea. Well, one way that we can improve performance of a typical processor is by designing um, a pipeline for these all these things that need to be done um, um, by the control unit while we're trying to decode um, and execute the instruction. Right, so, um, so, oh yeah, I mean, kind of before, I mean, th there's other ways that, that we could take advantage of technology to, to uh, get better performance, okay? So the, the most straightforward ways, which, which are, are you, know, you know, so, so, you know, ship manufacturers have relied on Moore's law to be increasing densities, which allows uh, both power consumption to go down and speeds to go up for the um, integrated circuits, right? So you get a natural boost in performance, you know, faster chips, 
um, um, because of those improvements um, in, in the manufacturing process, right? And those improvements uh, apply in, in, you know, not only just the processors, but the memory and, and other things that use integrated circuits. Um, but, but here, you know, um, it's becoming more important that, that we need other kinds of improvements uh, because we're reaching certain limits on Moore's law. Um, thus, you can get certain improvements from organizational enhancements, um, you know, so, so basically tuning the number of registers, making good decisions on, you know, your instruction set and trade-offs and those kinds of things will help with performance uh, cache. So because of the memory bottleneck, you know, the, the, the memory hierarchy has become more and more complex, more and more levels of cache, and, and we're getting more and more memory technologies, right? So instruction pipelining um, is another I, example of internal to the processor of, of a technology improvement, you know, tr where we're trying to boost performance. Right? And it's a simple idea. So if, if you know what an assembly line is in manufacturing, I mean, you know, that, that's what an instruction pipeline is. You know, it, it's as simple as that, right? So if, if we don't have dependence on the different stages in order to, you know, so, so if, if you think of all these as like stages in order to execute this instruction, if, if we don't have any dependence, so, so while we're fetching uh, one instruction, um, if we could be um, decoding the, ins the instruction, so, so while we're decoding the one instruction, if we could be, uh, fetching the next instruction, you know, and so on. If, if these have no dependence, then in theory, we can build this pipeline, this assembly line, um, right? And the speed up is, is um, in theory, is, 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 um, is one to one with the number of steps you have in your pipeline, okay? So if I can do all five, you know, however many steps I have in my pipeline, let's say each one of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's just say eight arbitrarily. If I can do all eight of these steps in parallel um, every time, I would actually have a, an eightfold increase in performance, right? So what would normally take me eight clock cycles to um, perform one instruction, um, uh, once I fill the pipeline, I would be um, completing an instruction every single cycle instead of every eight cycles, right? So no, anyway, I mean, you know, I can't stress that enough. I mean, the pipeline is a powerful idea, but then you have caveats. You know, you always have have caveats. You know, so so the ideal that you can do that that these that these different steps that you can identify. Are completely independent breaks down relatively quickly, right? So there's lots of dependencies in these in, in here that you just can't get around. So, so, you, so you're not going to ever be able to, to get an ideal design here uh, where, um, where you have steps that you can completely isolate and make completely independent. So. Um, so anyway, the, um, the, the, the simplest, you know, so if, if you were trying to build this and you wanted to learn how to do it, you know, you could start with, with the simplest example, like a two-stage um, instruction pipeline. Um, so for that, you might just um, break up the fetch um, into one part and the execute um, into your second stage of your pipeline. Um, So, I mean, right away, you know, you do have um, your first inkling of the, um, the non-independence, right? So um, if you're using the same register to do your decoding for the execute part as, as you're using to, to fetch into for the fetch part, um, um, 
in the processor, um, I mean, they'll interfere with each other, right? So, so you have to have something like like a separate register that holds the fetched value, um, and then that gets moved to somewhere else um, where you're doing the the decoding part for the execute stage, right? Um, So, and then um, there's other questions, okay? So another problem with that is that, um, um, you know, fetch, I mean, execute kind of obviously, because execute includes um, all the operand decoding um, um, and um, the actual operation of the data, right? So, so you might want to break this up slightly differently if you're just doing it it's like two stages. So maybe like the all of the instruction decoding and the operand decoding and prefetching, you might do that as part of the first stage. And then the, um, the execution of the operation and the storing of the operation might be the second stage. So that might be a little bit more equal um, in terms of typically the duration, right? So that's the idea, again, the idea, whatever stages you break this up into, um, for your pipeline as an assembly line, um, you're going to have to have a basic cycle that depends on whatever the slowest stage is of the stages in your pipeline, right? So, and if one is significantly slower than any of the others, um, all of them are gonna be kind of, um, um, you know, they're, they're gonna all have to operate at, at the slowest one, um, slowest stage in your pipeline. So that's, that's a kind of um, dependency is, 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 is the timing of these. Um, but yeah, th there's other reasons. So, so, I mean, even if you're two stages, if you're talking just about a two stage pipeline, were of equal duration, in theory, you could double your performance, but that's unlikely because there's other dependencies. Um, so, uh, so uh, you know, besides the, the timing, uh, the biggest one that we'll spend a little bit of time on here is that um, the, this prefetch with a two-stage pipeline assumes that you, um, always know what the next instruction is that you need to fetch during the prefetch, right? But you don't always know that, okay? So um, if you have branch instructions, which you will have, and you'll have lots of branch instructions, um, depending on the branch, and, and actually I'm a little bit wrong here. I don't remember if the textbook stated this, but um, it doesn't even have to be a conditional branch. Any branch instruction uh, in theory is problematic because if the, the branch instruction um, would cause you to jump to a non-contiguous address. So that means instead of using the program counter to determine the next instruction you're gonna execute, the, the jump instruction is gonna modify the program counter to some other location than simply incrementing the program counter. But even for like a um, unconditional absolute jump, in theory, you're, you're still going to have to um, decode the operand, even if you're using like a direct operand for a direct unconditional jump, you have to go through some of this decode stage to know what the new value of the program or counter is gonna be, okay? So it's not just a conditional branch, it's, it's kind of any branch instruction causes a problem with this pipeline, with, 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 even with a two-stage pipeline with, with the prefetch, okay? Um, so there's different ways you can handle this. Um, um, and, and we talk about this. So the simplest is we just guess. Um, so the, the, and, and the best guess um, is just to, you know, just, to use, just guess that the, the jump is not going to occur so just use the, um, the the regular program counter and fetch the next instruction, as if as if the program counter will be incremented and you won't take the branch. Right? And and if this turns out to be false, if you do have to do a, a branch, 
that causes what's known as uh, you have to clear the, the pipeline, clear the instruction pipeline. So you have to discard the work. So for a two instruction pipeline, I mean, you haven't done too much. You just have to discard that prefetch um, and then you'll, you'll, you'll end up fetching um, the, the branch, wherever you branch to, right? And, and then you'll have an empty cycle on your pipeline, so an empty stage on your pipeline. If you have more than one stage, you have to clear out uh, as soon as you determine. So, so once you get to the, the portion where, where you've executed the instruction, wherever that happens, maybe before the right, but, but at some point when you're executing a, a branch instruction, you'll finally determine where the program counter, whether the, the program counter needs to just do the regular increment or not. And, and if it's being jumped to a non-contiguous location, at that point, you're, you're, you've invalidated everything behind you in your instruction pipeline until you, you know, change the PC um, and reload the pipeline um, starting at that new point there, okay? So that, that's one of the biggest causes of, um, of degradation of the performance, okay? And I'll talk a little bit about that here. Um, um, in a bit, how you can think about that. Um, so, but but even even though even if you have a reduced effectiveness because of, of branching instructions um, and maybe variable timing of the stages, um, and also there, there's con, there's possible contention um, that we haven't talked about yet. Um, but but even though you have have some degradation, um, you will still get some speed up, right? So so pipelines still do help. Um, but yeah, so so the, the 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 theoretical speed up is directly related to the number of stages that you can decompose your pipeline into, right? So more is better. Um, although you know, um, I mean, at some point. That there's there's um, there, there's diminishing returns, so so you probably can't push this to you know hundreds of 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 steps in your instruction pipeline. So there's probably an effective upper limit of, of five or ten um, steps um, in an effective pipeline before um, um, one stage just has to be much larger in time than any other, um, or 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 or, um, or whatever. So. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you might decompose into how many stages? Six. Um, so you got some design goals for this. I mean, you want to try to compose these so that all the stages are nearly equal for typical cases, right? So some of these stages sometimes might be really small. You know, so so if I do an uh, operand address calculation that that's um, a immediate value, I don't have any memory fetch at all. Um, so so the 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 time might be effectively zero for that. But 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 um, but for other addressing modes, you know, you might have to do one fetch or two fetches, right? And in that case, you might want to break those stages actually into separate things. So if I do have an indirect memory fetch, um, um, that might happen in a separate stage or something like that. So, um, um, yeah, so some more things. So, so besides like branching, um, that there's lots of overhead. Um, um, there's variable variability in the timing. Um, there's overhead involved in moving data. So you know it's, it's, you're going to have to replicate some things like instruction registers and stuff, and you have to move the data. Um, so the, the 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 place where you put the data for the fest instruction has to move um, um, to somewhere else so I can fetch the next instruction while I'm decoding it, you know, so that's all overhead that you're adding on. So that, that's part of the reason why there's going to be diminishing returns um, um, to trying to add more and more steps to a pipeline. 
your amount of control logic is going to increase. Um, I'm not certain if it increases linearly or maybe faster, like it might increase like with the square of the number of stages typically, um, which would make it very tough to push it much bigger. Um, all right, so I did want to talk a little bit about the, the pipeline performance, although, you know, um, I kind of, I got, I, I went down a rabbit hole here. I got interested in it myself, uh, but, I, but I'll, I'll walk you through some of these here. I, I think one of the problems that I gave for the, the problem set um, for this material this week, um, um, you can use uh, this equation to calculate the, the effective speed up for a pipeline here. Um, so we mostly assume for, for, for this here, you know, th these equations come directly from our textbook that, um, we use this tau, which is the time delay for the ith stage. Um, and then we just calculate, um, so, so, so kind of like we were saying tau m or tau maximum, um, that's just whichever stage ends up being the one that takes the most time that's going to be the one that you have to mostly uh, worry about when you want to calculate the effective speed up, right? So, so you can you can you can effectively think of if you can calculate, um, and, and yeah, that that th this this tau is, is kind of both a function of the time delay of the circuitry for each stage. Um, also, there's like a time delay um, for this latch here, but. Um, but anyway, so whichever the largest one is, if, if you just know that, that's effectively going to be how long you need to allow for each stage uh, for them all to successfully complete. If you have that, then um, you can determine what the total time is going to be um, for a pipeline with, with some number of K stages, you know, so like six. Um, for this example here are two for our uh, uh, prefetch um, execute um, two stage example. So, so, so K is the number of stages um, and, um, and then N is the number of um, instructions um, that you need that you want to execute. Um, so again, this, this calculation and speed up. So, so given this, I mean, you can work this out. The, the, the spec textbook showed you, um, you know, like, like if you have a, um, uh, instruction pipeline with nine, uh, or with, with six stages, and you've got 14 instructions, um, kind of where, where this comes from. So basically, you know, to interpret this, you need sort of, if you have like a pipeline with, with six um, steps, you're going to need like six steps to load the pipeline, to get it completely loaded up. And then after that, so after your initial load stage, assuming you don't hit any branches or anything, you're going to be um, finishing one instruction for every cycle after that, okay? So, so that's why, so, so this is kind of representing the, 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 the steps you need uh, to get it, the, the pipeline loaded up. And then after that, for every cycle, I'm gonna be finishing one instruction. Assuming you can break up your pipeline. That, that's another design um, consideration that I, I didn't talk about, but you wanna, you want to have it so that your stages complete one instruction once you get through all the stages, right? No matter what instruction, for, for any instruction in your instruction set architecture, right? Um, all right, but anyway, you know, you can kind of work through that yourself, but, but that's the, the, the N minus one, um, you know, it, it just to work it out, but um, that's what you'll get. So for 14 total instructions uh, with a six stage pipeline, 
um, you will find that it takes um, uh, 14 um, um, steps, you know, but the, the total time is going to depend on the tau maximum, right? So, so whatever the, 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 the number of, of the, the, the amount of time for each um, um, stage, um, that, that would tell you 14 times that would be how long it would take to execute these 14 instructions with um, a six pipeline, a six stage pipeline here. So, you know. So you don't really get a speed up in this case, but you, you will get a speed up um, if you have more than 14 instructions, right? Um, and effectively, since the K only happens for um, the initial load of the pipeline, if you have much more than K instructions before you hit a branch, you'll effectively get um, you know, a speed up of, of, of whatever K is because you're now executing one instruction every cycle instead of one instruction every K cycles um, that you would need it, okay? And to calculate the speed up, um, if you just divide this expression by what the time would be if you have no pipeline, which is what the top is here, Right, and since they both have tau, you can you can you can figure out that they'll that that'll cancel out, and that will give you the speed up um, in total for you know pipeline with k steps basically um, uh, in order to execute in instructions. Um, right, and again though this this completely assumes that we never hit a branch instruction or have any other kinds of contentions that cause us to. Um, uh, to not be able to execute one stage uh, because um, it has a dependency on uh, on, a, on a previous stage or another stage in the pipeline. So, um, so why this is important, um, um, this expression tells you again that, uh, you know, if I have 20 stages, um, uh, all of these, you know, let me state like for um, the easiest one to see is maybe for 10 stages here. You know, if, if I have a pipeline with 10 stages, as long as I have significantly more than 10 instructions, I can in theory approach a speed up factor of 10 times. So I'll actually be executing code 10 times faster than I would um, if I didn't have the 10 stage pipeline in there, right? So again, that's assuming everything works perfectly. Uh, we're avoiding all dependencies and, and we're avoiding all branches that cause the pipeline um, to have to be cleared out and restarted, right? Um, However, um, so, so to, to bring this into um, the, the final thing I want to talk about here um, in terms of performance, um, this is just another one. So, you know, again, um, if we're looking at the number of instructions, um, um, this will um, um, The, the reason why I had this figure is assume something like um, we can only execute, let's say at most 10 instructions before we normally hit a branch, okay? So, so if we have um, a probability that, that, that uh, every one in 10 instructions, um, we hit a branch instruction or a jump instruction, um, this is what this is trying to, to illustrate, right? So, so even if we had um, a 20 stage pipeline, um, if we had a 10% chance of, of hitting a branch, or if we hit a branch, or, or if we normally can only go 10 instructions before the pipeline gets cleared out, at best, we will see, be able to achieve um, a seven times speed up factor, um, even with um, a, um, a pipeline of 20 steps here. So, so in theory, we could get a, a speed up of 20, but we'll, the effective speed up is gonna be a lot less 
um, if we're only getting 10 instructions at a time that we can uh, do with our pipeline here, right? Um, and then that leads me to the final thing that I discussed here in my notes. This wasn't in the textbook. This, this was actually um, one of the, the questions. Um, uh, it wasn't one of the questions I gave on the problem set here, but, but the question was, okay, let, let's assume that, um, um, I'll just work through this here. Let's assume that there's a probability um, uh, P, uh, so, so P is the probability that uh, an instruction is a branch instruction, okay? So P can be a number from zero to one, meaning, so, so if probability is zero, that means the program has no branch instructions. And the probability is one, that means every instruction is a branch instruction, okay? But just because an instruction is a branch instruction, that doesn't mean that, that your pipeline is going to get um, invalidated. So only if the branch instruction has to be taken, so it causes the, the branch to occur, um, would you end up going to a non-contiguous uh, location and, and having your pipeline have to be restarted, okay? So Q is, is the probability that if you hit a branch instruction, uh, what's the probability that uh, the, the branch has to be taken to a non-contiguous address? All right, and that gives you, that's Q, okay? Um, so if you have those two probabilities, really the probability of P times the probability of Q is going to be the total probability that I get that I'm going to hit a, a non-contiguous branch instruction. Okay, so you could. So this question I could have also um, reformulated it just as a single probability. So what's the what's the probability that any single instruction will uh, cause a non-contiguous branch, okay? So, you know, the, the, this is useful because you could empirically evaluate. So, so what's the probability that any instruction causes a branch, right? Or I could evaluate these um, separately. So what's the, the probability, um, Maybe easier to evaluate the probability that that an instruction is a branch. You just you just count up the number of, of, of branches or jumps compared to the total number of instructions in your program. So that's that's kind of your your probability, your base probability. That's a branch. Um, um, the probability that a branch will be taken is a little bit tougher, right? So sometimes you know your branches might be very um, infrequently taken, but in other kinds of loops, they might be taken much more frequently. So, um, anyway, I mean, if you compare this to, to the previous one, um, I, again, you know, you, you probably don't have to completely follow all these, but it, it's, it's not too tough because um, what, we're, what we're doing is that um, basically P times Q is gonna be the, um, is gonna be the probability that I'm gonna have to restart the pipeline. So if you multiply that times the number of instructions, um, then times the other thing, uh, th th that gives you an estimate for how many times you have to restart and refill the pipeline, right? And then one minus PQ is the, the, the estimate of the number of times that I have instructions that are working, well, that are working optimally, um, things are flowing through the pipeline. So if you multiply that times the other part of the um, expression, um, that'll give you an estimate for um, the amount of time where instructions are coming out um, every instruction cycle from the pipeline here, right? And then from that, again, you can do the same thing in order to come up with an expression for um, the speed up you expect, but with these probabilities in here, right? So that gives us, and the reason why I kind of uh, went down this rabbit hole for myself is because I wanted to have a feel for um, the question. So, um, so, so with the diagram, with this figure, which is based on that equation, um, 
I can ask questions like, okay, if, if I have, um, let's just say that um, there's a 10% chance that every, any instruction causes a non-contiguous branch. Okay, so a 10% chance could happen. Um, uh, remember, if, 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 let's say if, if, if 10% of the instructions were jump instructions, and if I have a 10% chance for each jump instruction that um, it's going to um, cause a non-contiguous branch, that's actually only a 1% chance because that's 0.1 times 0.1. So that's right here. So if I have a 1% chance, if, 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 every, if I have a 1% chance that any instruction is gonna cause a branch, um, I'm somewhere right here, you know, like, like something like 0.1 times 0.1. So that, that ends up being like a nine, 9.5 speed up on total here, right? I think that's pretty low. I, I think, um, um, again, you're, the, 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 what your chance would be that you need a non-contiguous branch to, is gonna depend a lot on how your program looks, um, how you, it, it, this, this would have a big impact on um, optimizations of your compiler. So assuming that you're not programming assembly, like you're writing like a C program or something that's kind of trying to optimize, um, uh, you know, to um, um, with like your pipelining um, in uh, mind, uh, but, but, you know, like, like a more, a more realistic might be less, I think might be like uh, 10%, let's say. So, so if you have a program that, that needs to jump non-contiguously 10% of the time, that's something like, um, let's say 0.2 times 0.2 is actually 0.04. That, that's a little bit less than 5%. But that gives you, uh, I should have mentioned that this is, um, this is a pipeline with, with um, um, uh, 10 steps, 10 stages, K is 10 here. All right, so in theory, we can only get at most a 10 speed up if, if we never hit a branch, right? Um, so yeah, for 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 like a 0.2 times 0.2, that that's like a 0.04. That's a four percent, but that gives you probably an effective speed up of about 7.5. Okay, so 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 if 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 you're branching four percent of the time, um, um, your speed up is only going to be about 7.5 for this this pipeline with ten instructions. Um, to get to about a ten percent. Um, branching, that would be something more like uh, 0.3 times 0.3, that, that would give you 9%, right? So that's somewhere like about right here, maybe maybe a bit above a speed up of five here, right? Um, so anyway, I mean, it, it, is, uh, it is effective. So, so uh, even, even at like a, if only 9% of your instructions cause a branch, that means that even with a pipeline that in theory can give you a, fa a speed up factor of 10, you're probably only going to get about half of that speed up normally, right? And, and but but this th this also would illustrate the importance of um, of um, minimizing unconditional branches, right? So either through your optimizing compiler or whatever you whatever you do, um, if, if your percentage or probability of unconditional branches is high, if it's much above 10%, um, you're gonna quickly, you know, your pipeline is gonna quickly become ineffective, right? So, so if it's, you know, 0.5 times 0.5 is gonna be giving you 25%, um, and that's probably giving you, you know, down to two or three speed up. Um, um, realm um, in that case. Uh, all right. So anyway, that's that was kind of something I, I'd kind of fallen down into a rabbit hole there. But um, but I, I was interested in that question. So that that gives you a way of, of thinking about um, you know. So so you know a big problem with these with this pipelining is hitting these unconditional branches. Um, so how how bad of an effect will that have on speed up based on you know how likely it is that you're going to hit these unconditional branches? You know, an expression like this can tell you.
um, that kind of thing. So. Um, okay, so let's let's wrap up this this section here. Um, so besides the all, all those ha hazards that I've been talking about are really examples of control hazards. Um, so a hazard in this case is when a pipeline or some portion of the pipeline has to stall. So that, that was the technical term I was looking for. So this is this is known as a stall. So when you hit something like this, um, the, the, the pipeline has to be cleared off and, and you have to refill the pipeline um, to restart it for a stall like this. Um, so besides control hazards, um, there's really two other kinds of hazards. There's resource hazards. That's when two or more instructions that are already in the pipeline need the same resource. So usually like a memory location. Um, so the, the biggest, uh, I mean, in, in general, I mean, all, all fetches, um, um, are really kind of examples of resource hazards. So all memory references, uh, fetches to or from memory, um, can be a type of resource hazard. Um, the, and the only reason why this isn't, and, and actually, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not certain, you know, I probably have to do some reading on this. These could be as big as kind of the branching hazards that I was emphasizing here because I mean, not all not all instructions that you execute um, are going to need to uh, fetch data to and from memory. So you'll have um, instructions with data already in registers. Uh, you'll have other kinds of instructions doing things, right? But if a lot of your instructions are doing memory fetches, um, you can typically only do one memory fetch at a time. So you would really have a hard time parallelizing the different stages if if more than one stage needs to do a fetch right so that that could definitely be a big uh, but in this case you um, um if, if like if you have two stages that need to fetch um right now um from memory um it doesn't cause a control hazard that where you have to stall the pipeline and completely clear it out it would only cause those two stages to have to be serialized in theory um so um and then resource data data hazards are similar to resource hazards um but but here the the, the um the conflict is more direct so um if if two instructions in the pipeline need to directly do a calculation on the same piece of data, the same value, which again, is not gonna be uncommon. Um, so, I mean, as long as the pipeline always um, is, is, is executing in order, um, then things will be fine. Um, although, you know, again, this, this shows that, that, you know, if I'm keeping results in like registers or memory, uh, you have to be careful that um, um, things stay in order. Um, and um, um, you're going to have to have replication of things like registers um, for a lot of this stuff. So. So anyway, yeah, if you read the, the chapter about superscalar um, 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 pipeline um, and, and uh, um, uh, how you do those things, um, it'll talk a little bit more about this because one of the things you can do is you can try and schedule these in order to reduce uh, these kinds of resource hazards and data hazards. Uh, but when you do that, you might end up doing steps in your pipeline out of order and that's that's then where you have to start worrying about the, these kinds of data hazard sorts of things where um, um, you need to have them in a particular order to get the correct result. So, 
Um, so I think, um, I mean, you know, we, we talked a lot already about um, uh, branch or control hazards, also called branch hazards. Um, uh, I, I need to kind of move on here, but um, I mean, there's, there's, there's different ways that you can deal with a branch hazard. And I, from my, my understanding, my feeling, um, most processors just do the simple um, method of, uh, you know, just continuing to assume that the pipeline is going to be fetching the next instruction. Um, um, and that, um, Um, I mean, that's the simplest kind of branch prediction here. I was trying to, trying to remember here, but, but that's, that's where you basically always predict that we will take the, the, the program counter, the, the, non, the, the contiguous next instruction instead of a non-contiguous jump. So that's one type of, of, of branch prediction. I mean, since a branch, since all jumps really just either um, are, are, are one way or another, um, 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 you know, there's only two choices, but but um, it's not always going to be 50-50, right? So, so because for conditional branches, you know, you, you, you might be much more likely to do one thing than the other. And, and again, it's also going to be dependent on that particular branch and the program, you know, the, what the probability is. So um, it is possible that you could try and do something like um, if you hit a branch, try and fetch both the, um, uh, the you know the next instruction according to PC, but also fetch the um, instruction according to the branch. That's the multiple um, instruction, and that's kind of what, um, from my understanding, kind of what Spectre and things like that, uh, these kinds of of of, of, of prefetch. Um, but that's kind of limited. So yeah, what happened? What do you do if you if 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 I I hit one branch and I start trying to follow both branches on two separate pipelines, and then I hit another branch inside of there, that kind of thing. So not to mention that now you're talking about having multiple pipelines um, instead of, of like a single pipeline. So. Um, yeah, and, and there's a lot more. I'm, I'm going to let you kind of read those um, about the um, uh, about um, uh, how you can deal with the um, um, branching hazards here. So. All right. Um, yeah, it's getting kind of late, so um, I just kind of want to go through, say one or two things, then maybe about. Um, the uh, x86 and the ARM architectures here. Um, um, so, and actually I might not stay too much here because yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, 9.30 here. Um, but yeah, there's a little bit of discussion about some more details about you know the actual organization of the x86 and the ARM. Um, we've mentioned a few of these already. Um, there are actually what uh, eight general purpose registers um, on the 32-bit mode, um, uh, and there's more on the 64-bit mode, 16 for the x86. Although I believe, if 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 I remember right, on these, so so, so the ones that, that that we talked about like A, B, C, D, um, but there's also four others um, that uh, um, you can kind of think of as general purpose, but they hold, um, um, that's what I think, but, but yeah, these are the things like that accumulator and base, A, B, C, D. Um, I believe for the 64-bit x86 architecture, this jump to 16, but, um, these are kind of, these kind of come in pairs so that you know you still have something that you think of as an a register uh, 
you know, two 32 bit A registers that can get, be combined into a single one. So you get like a 64 bit register. So I think that's why the, the general registers doubled. Right. Um, and then there's other, so there's like segment registers. Um, um, these mostly hold pointers into segment tables, um, you know, which like, so you have like your program, program segment table um, and um, the, the code segment table, which, which is really a pointer to the current um, page in memory that you're executing uh, the next instruction from. Um, your stack segment, um, which which I believe is your um, your procedure call stack for the um, the user visible stack for, for doing your function calls and procedure calls. Um, and um, yeah, apparently um, that I didn't really quite know this, but but there's there's really kind of some separate registers for the floating point unit operation. So some registers to hold um, floating point numeric values. Um, and, you know, because of overflow that we talked a little bit about, I guess that these are like 80 bits instead of 32 or 64 bits um, so that um, it can perform like 64 bit floating point operations, um, but at least um, keep the results even for a bit of overflow, you know, for some of those. Okay. Um, all right, and, and um, yeah, Let's see. Um, there are, you know, there are um, status registers like we talked about. So, so that's that's known as E flags, uh, or I guess it's like E flags and um, um, R flags on the sixty-four bit mode. Um, so apparently they double the size of it, but they actually don't use the, the I mean, basically this is 64 because it's the same size as the, as the, as the basic um, um, architecture size, uh, but they still only really use like the 32 bits and the other bits are just reserved, but, but mostly unused. Um, so really even for 64 bit, it's the same, these same um, flag bits in, in the E flag register here. Um, so these have the ones, you know, again, we, we, we've mentioned these in, in lots of different contexts. So you got your zero and your sign flag and other stuff. Um, and we also have the um, the, 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 the control bits, um, the, the status bits for things like the, the, the interrupt enable flag, um, the, um, um, I thought the mode flag was here, maybe that's somewhere else, um, interrupt enable, trap flag, I don't know if I mentioned that one before, but yeah, I mean, you know, if you've ever done like a symbolic debugger, the, so you can step through the code, um, instruction by instruction, um, you may or may not have ever kind of wondered about that, but um, there's actually that actually in order to implement debuggers like that, that re relies on a hardware feature. Um, so you can set um, this kind of trap flag, which causes um, an interrupt to occur after the execution of each instruction. Um, so when you set that, you can use that to set that so that you can run a program that will return control back to your debugger um, so that you can step through another program that your debugger is stepping through. So, um, um, 
uh, I guess it's the, um, yeah, besides the, the status E flag, status flag, there are a separate control register and that's where the, um, the, the mode um, flag is. And, and, and uh, x86 is, is simpler than ARM. It only has two um, control modes, which, which I think um, are talked about here. Oh, yeah. Um, um, but, but yeah, the, the x86 has this protection enable in the control register um, to enable or, or disable the protected mode, you know, and the protected mode is your more privileged mode. Um, okay, and I think I'm going to skip over the interrupt processing. Um, um, you should read through that though. Um, and then, real quickly, the ARM processor. Um, some of the details of that. Um, so it's kind of a good summary. Um, the the figure fourteen point two six of of the ARM registers. Um, so yeah, actually the ARM, which is which is a, an example of a reduced instruction set computer, um, apparently kind of has a, a moderate number of, of uniform registers. So other risk systems uh, tend to probably have more than kind of 16, but there's kind of a basic 16, although that's a little bit of an underrepresentation. In fact, you know, like it says here, um, um, in, in our textbook, um, Um, or where is it? Uh, oh, there. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's actually 37 registers in ARM, uh, but the, the, the way it comes up with that is because um, 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 these that are all shared over the seven different uh, processing modes that are defined for ARM. Um, So, so there's really, uh, there's kind of 60, you can really only access these in groups of 16. So, so the, the, the seven, the 37 comes because it's, it's really kind of like seven times 16. Um, no, that's not right. But, but, but um, 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 I mean, all of these are really shared between the modes, but, but, but you get more than because some of these aren't really shared between the different modes here. And, um, Anyway, yeah, I mean, the, the, the registers 0 through 12 on the ARM are kind of uh, very general purpose ones, um, and, and those are mostly available through all the modes except for the fast interrupt mode here. Register 13, 14, 15 are really kind of, they're really not general purpose, they're, they're special purpose. So the register 15 is really, really holds the program counter. Um, so yeah, you can't directly set that. That's going to be set by jump instructions. Um, and, and, and 13 and 14 are also like the, the uh, stack pointer. So that's the, the, the pointer to the procedure call stack if you're in user mode. But if you're in these other mode, th this is a pointer to a stack for like system calls or service calls. Um, and um, link register is, I can't remember at the moment, but, but a similar kind of idea. Um, Or, you know, like if you're currently in the interrupt insect exception mode, um, uh, these things are going to be, you know, your pointers to your interrupt table handler, uh, or sorry, pointers to your stack for handling while you're handling interrupts and returning from interrupts. So, um, and um, there is one kind of main status register, which is, um, Um, like uh, 32 bits, um, where again, there's another kind of nice figure of this one in there somewhere. Um, or I guess there's, yeah, there's like 16 bits 
kind of, of um, flags, status flags, uh, again, like your NZ, CNV, and then there's another 16 bits of uh, mostly holding the control bits. So you can think, do things like, again, like, like enable interrupts. Um, you know, these, these down here are actually the mode bits, so you can tell which of the, uh, the seven modes that you're in. So, um, yeah, and just a word about that uh, again. So, so you know, our, the the ARM architecture has much, has quite a few more uh, modes than x86. Um, so the idea is, is to you know give a little bit more power to the operating system. So these are mostly used by operating systems um, um, to to tailor the the, the software to a vi variety of circumstances, right? Um, so, I mean, you have your basic user mode, um, but besides user mode, you can think of all these others um, as kind of privileged modes. Um, so, and the one that's mostly used is supervisor mode, right? So these, these most directly correspond to the x86 user mode um, and then um, um, system mode or, or, or supervisor mode, right? Um, and then these others, uh, if you're in any of these modes, you can freely change into any of the others if you need to, but you can't change from user mode into one of these um, privilege modes um, in ARM here. Uh, but yeah, these others uh, are entered in normally, like for example, um, uh, if an interrupt occurs, um, a normal thing to do is to change into interrupt mode so that you can use the um, register 1314 um, and, and you won't affect any of these other registers, um, um, you know, what, what the current system call stack is in supervisor mode, what the current user call user uh, stack is for, for the procedure call stack in user mode and so on, right? You can use the, the interrupt um, request stack uh, to process the interrupt and return from it, um, you know. And um, 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 I, I kind of skipped over the talking about the interrupt mode for the x86, but x86 has has two different kinds of interrupts. There's maskable and non-maskable interrupts. And in general, the non-maskable interrupts are kind of our low priority ones, and you can actually ignore them by masking them. But there are uh, interrupts that you really can't ignore. Um, so I believe on the arm, kind of the, the interrupts and the fast interrupts are similar. Fast interrupts are kind of um, are kind of the high priority ones, right? So anyway, there's kind of really two potential modes, interrupts, or fast interrupt processing. So, so fast interrupts can, can interrupt regular interrupts, but not vice versa. So. Um, all right, so yeah, uh, I've kind of lost my voice here. Hopefully that, that gives you a quick flavor of, of, of the, the particulars of the ARM and the x86. But let's stop it there for today. Um, Unless anybody has any kinds of comments or questions they want to ask about here. About this or about the test. So as I mentioned at the beginning, if anybody wasn't here at the beginning, um, um, I will have the test up and open sometime on Friday, although I might still be working on it on Friday morning. So hopefully anybody, hopefully nobody was hoping to start it bright and early on Friday morning, but sometime by Friday by noon or so should be up to uh, Dr. Harker. Yeah, sure. I have a question. Um, so uh, you were talking about the final exam, right? Next yeah. Friday, would it be like, cause I have two more classes and uh, it will be like- Yeah, I'm talking about the- At the same time. I'm talking about the second test. Um, so um, um, yeah, I, I talked a little bit about this in the announcement, but basically it will be open starting on this Friday, this week. Um, and, I, and, I, and like the first test, I mean, I am giving you some time to do it. So you have all the way till next Friday to, to get it done and, and turned in. But but you can work on it any time that's convenient for you between then and now. And yeah, if you do have finals next week, um, you know, I encourage you to get it done early. So yeah, I mean, start on it, maybe get it done 
um, before Monday or something like that, or whatever works for you. So, but yeah, that's that's the plan. So, so we have a second test, and then we also have a final exam, or these two no, tests together? No, no. This? There's just test two. Test two is the, the second test. That's the only test. So oh, yeah, so yeah. If I said if, if I said final, I didn't, didn't mean to confuse you, but um, but yeah. So we, we're just having two tests. The, the second test, I mean, it's it's mostly on stuff since the first test. So that's mostly stuff from chapter eight through fourteen. I mean, th there might be a few little things. I mean, you know, of, of course, the stuff builds on the stuff. You, you do have to know the stuff from the first half of the course, but it's 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 really not too comprehensive. It's mostly just um, focusing on stuff from chapter eight on since we took the first test, so. Right, right, similar to the test one, right? Okay. Right, and yeah, the structure will be similar to the test one, so. I also had a question because um, we had like a problem sets and stuff and I was just like, you know, I, I work on several, like I didn't provide the answer for all of them because you said it's extra credit in like, my direction also is like I'm taking thesis next semester and so I'm not really focused on comprehensive exam and I'm mainly on NLP area so these are not some things that I'm really focused so are they all extra credit or were they were supposed to be submitted yeah no they're all they're all they're all extra credit yeah so my plan is I'll just look at anybody that submitted those, especially people that were looking for an extra credit opportunity. And, and if you did most of them or all of them, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, a bump on, on, on some points on, on the test one or the test two. So, but yeah, anybody that didn't submit them won't lose anything. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. Other questions? All right. Um, well, um, so yeah, so we'll kind of come to the end of the semester mostly. So, I mean, I'll still be around if anybody needs anything, you know, email me um, or, you know, I, I can still set up a session if you need to talk about something, but uh, otherwise, yeah. So I hope everybody had a good semester um, and uh, finish this off strong and um, yeah, I'll see you guys later then. Can you hang on for a sec? Uh, sure. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. I go ahead and stop the recording now. <laughs>